Okay. So what the heck is this Kaz thing? Um, so yeah, I am with OSS and um, we are a part of Rutgers. Um, oh wait, this is describing me, oof. So I'm a uh, sys student systems programmer at OSS and you've probably seen me related to Hacker U stuff. Um, What's your name? My name is Mickey. <laughs> uh, so Open System Solutions is um, basically a student org that's part of Rutgers. It's a bunch of students working on like software stuff. We build like the Rutgers mobile app. Uh, we have a URL shortener. And these things are actually surprisingly used a lot. Um, we also do some other stuff um, like admin tools and packages. Um, I guess the elevator pitch for why it'd be good to work here is it's a pretty good learning opportunity. You sort of get to play with a lot of stuff and get thrown into things and there's good connections and it's a steady gig. It pays my bills at least. Okay, so what is CAS? So you've probably seen this page before. Um, basically, the idea is you, you won't, it's called the central authentication service. And the idea is instead of having, you know, like the WebReg stuff and like degree navigator, having different passwords for everything, it gets very confusing. And it actually leads to password reuse, which can be pretty insecure and um, results in uh, password stuffing attacks where people figure out passwords you use a lot and then just try to use it somewhere else. So this solves it. You can have one password that's secure. You only need to remember one password. Um, and this is part of, part, part of a broader sort of idea of uh, protocols and technologies called SSO, or single sign-on. Um, so yeah, the idea of a single sign-on system is you've got one username and password to rule them all, except the iLabs. <laughs> well, I'll talk about my guesses later. Um, another thing to note is uh, protocols are different from implementation. So you, you, you can kind of think uh, like HTTPS versus Firefox and Chrome. Firefox and Chrome are both web clients, basically, but they are different things that have different features. But since there's a standard protocol, it doesn't matter whether you're using Firefox, or at least in theory, it shouldn't matter if you're using Firefox or Chrome. All the web pages should pretty much load the same. Um, and the great thing about having this sort of separated is people can cooperate and still do their own thing. Because that's one of the annoying things is no matter how organized you are, people still want to do their own thing. And people get into heated arguments. Oh. OK. So what are some of the SSO protocols? So one, obviously, that we use is central authentication system. This isn't just a Rutgers thing. When I showed up here and I first saw this, I thought this was like something we put together. But it's actually a standard protocol. And as you can see here, we got cas.iu.edu. So Indiana University uses it. And I think it's mostly a bunch of universities use it. Um, uh, some other protocols is there's SAML, which is uh, Rutgers uses for third party applications because it provides some extra security features. Um, LDAP ish, which if you've logged into like the, the, the computer labs, you might have seen RAD, which stands for Rutgers Active Directory. Um, which is basically just LDAP, but Microsoft decided to give it a different name because that's what they do. Um, and then there's another protocol called OAuth, which is commonly used by uh, Facebook, Google, Twitter, those sort of people. Um, you don't hear a lot about SAML, and you hear about OAuth a lot because OAuth uses JSON and SAML uses XML. 
So sort of group think often people will choose technologies just because it doesn't have XML. OK, so here's how CAS works. <laughs> it's this, this is a lot. And there's some background stuff. And it's like, why are the arrows going all these different directions? So instead of getting straight into it, I'm actually going to um, explain s some of the basics of authentication systems. I split it into three A's. So the first one is authentication. So you can sort of imagine someone using a web request as kind of like they're sending someone a postcard and trying to get, hopefully, a response from them, unless they fell asleep. So in this case, I'm saying, server, please send $500 to this address. Sincerely, some person. And it's going to some sketchy PO box. You know, and if you receive this in the mail, you'll be like, what, who? And then throw it out. So one of the first things with authentication is you want to know who's even asking you to do something. So the next step up is providing a username. So I'm saying, it's me. Uh, please give me $500. Um, but there's still a problem with this. I'm asking you to send it to the sketchy PO box. And it's like, how do you know this is really me? So we've got usernames, but that's not good enough because usernames are public information. So in order to get around this, you know, the server might ask, tell me something only Mickey J would know. So in this case, I say my password, which in this case is a like inside joke or something. And then the other thing to note is my actual, my actual address is there now. So they know it's definitely going to me. So uh, sort of the, the thing you see associated with authentication is sort of username and password or some kind of secret. And it's to make sure it's authentic, that it's actually coming from me. Um, anything confusing about that or questions? OK. So the next A, attributes. So one of the things you'll see is like if you go on to WebReg and you go on to like the Core Schedule Planner, it has your name in both. But you told neither of them your name. So how does it get your name in the first place? So one of the things that uh, authentic uh, auth systems will provide is basically attributes about users. And this is common information like your first and last name, some like IDs, which aren't entirely public knowledge, but can help you do specific things to a user quickly. And also, one of the other interesting things is like, what kind of person is this? Like all the faculty, staff, and whatever. Um, so part of the reason they do this is to share uh, data across applications. So you don't need to keep telling every single Rutgers service, what your first and last name is. That would be severely annoying. Um, the other idea is to have a single source of truth. So you don't need to go into every single application and update your mail address so that I stop getting your spam mail to my apartment. Um, and yeah. So that's basically attributes. And then the next thing is authorization. So, you know, you can sort of see the idea is, is this person allowed to do something? And in this case, the goose isn't allowed to quack violently. I don't know. But the goose doesn't understand. Luckily, the idea with these authentication systems is it shouldn't matter if the user understands, just as long as they can't steal money from your bank account. Um, so yeah. And the idea is it, it depends on what kind of person, potentially. Like may, maybe you'll give your, your sibling $500, but you're not going to give me $500, much to my dismay. Um, and a lot of the time, these sort of authorization rules are based off of attributes in this system. So that's why it's really important that these auth systems also provide those attributes to services. 
Um, there's two common patterns that you'll see uh, with authorization. There's basically role-based uh, role access control, which is depending on someone's role. So like a faculty member can change grades, but not a student. Um, and then there's also access control list type things, where you have a list of people who are allowed to do something, do a specific thing. So like in this case, only I can view my grades. Um, in Rutgers systems, it's more complicated than that, because you can also sign up and get your parent hooked in, where they can see your grades too. So that's like, you can't do that? No, you can't. I just oh. You, should. <laughs> you shouldn't? <laughs> well, I don't, so I won't blame you. But that's basically just adding another name to the list of people who can do something. So yeah. Any questions? OK, cool. So this is all great. Let's get into a real world-ish example. So one of the common things that happens in a lot of businesses is using LDAP. And this stands for Lightweight Directory Access Protocol. And one of the things when I first heard about this is I was confused because I thought it was about files. But directory is not referring to files here. Um, it's actually referring to like a business directory. So you can see. Like in this case, when you go into a building, when you first walk in, they got a directory of like what businesses are here and like what floor they're on. So you can kind of think of a, a directory as basically like a list of people and information about them, or people and their attributes. Um, probably one of the most common ways this is implemented with applications is you do what's called an LDAP bind with someone's username and password, and that authenticates them with the LDAP protocol. And then you can use LDAP to then search for attributes about that person. And then uh, the application itself, not the LDAP protocol, can then check its own auth rules to see you know, if they can even use this application to begin with or if they can use just like one specific feature, potentially, of the application. Um, so yeah. This is what you see a lot with uh, computer logins. So like the, uh, the iLabs probably use LDAP bind just to check to see if this is a valid username and password. And also like the Windows machines at the computer lab, when you use RAD, it's talking to some LDAP server. Um, and then it can actually see if you're a good person. Um, well, I guess not if you're a good person. It will check to see if you have a valid login. <laughs> um, but yeah, so that highlights one of the advantages of SSO is you don't need to create a new user for every single computer you sign into, um, which that's fine and dandy for. Uh, logging into computer machines. But with like web applications, that can get a little bit more complicated, because you don't necessarily trust the UI that you're typing your username and password into. Not saying that the library computers are trustful, because someone could be key logging you. <laughs> um, but web UIs are extra. You shouldn't trust them. So sort of the, 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 the issue is with typing in your username and password and then handing this to someone's server. So like, you know, this might be bad because we don't control that code and we don't know if there's bad stuff in there. So potentially, like, if you tried to log into Canvas, Canvas would take your username and password. And they're like, ha ha, we have their password. We now own them and then let you use their service under the guise of them not being evil. Um, the other thing is uh, you might wind up with a lot of different login pages, which can lead to re-implementing login pages over and over again. And there's also sort of a psychological effect. You know, w w when I 
see a web page and it's asking for my Rutgers username and password and it doesn't look like the CAS page that I've seen five billion times, I start thinking like, is this really legit? Um, so yeah, part of the idea of CAS and other newer protocols is to fix some of the failings of other things, not necessarily LDAP specifically. Okay, but seriously though, how does CAS work? Um, so uh, one, one of the ways that it fixes that, those issues, is basically one, there's one login page that, so basically there's the client and the application server, which this is like my Rutgers or the thing you're trying to access. And then we also introduce a third server that we can trust. So we put the login page on this third server, and then we know that this application never actually gets your plain text password. So that adds a, a much higher level of security. Um, and then we can also store all of the attributes in that server. So then the application server, potentially if it's evil, can't just go berserk reading everyone's information. Um, so sort of how this flow works is if you type in like webreg.ruckers.edu, it will, the, the browser will go to the application and then the application will look at you and say, I don't know who you are. And then it'll basically redirect you to go to the login server so that the login server can figure out if you can be trusted. So this is sort of like you, you, you go ask your dad like if you can have a cookie and your dad says, is that okay with your mother? So basically you check the app and then the app's like, no, uh, please sign in. And then it'll send you to the authentication provider to log in. And then it'll, if you're not already logged in, it'll give you the login page and then you'll send the username and password, and then you'll be authenticated. Uh, the other nice feature of this is you don't have to log in over and over again. Because this the, the authentication provider can actually check to see if you already logged in before. In that case, it can actually just skip this step three and just send you back uh, to the application that you want to use. So basically, after this authentication the authenticate step, it's going to give you a redirect back to this application server. Uh, yeah, we're on step five. So this is sort of, this is called a callback, basically. Um, if you're familiar with JavaScript or other stuff, the idea is this, you're effectively asking the authentication for server for something, and then it's sort of responding with this callback request. So it'll shove some extra information, like a, uh, a ticket, basically. It'll give you a magic number, and then the application can take that magic number and then ask for more stuff from the authentication provider. So basically, once you get this callback and you have the ticket, the, the application's got to say, you know, is this really valid? You know, because, you know, theoretically, like, this kid, you know, just left the room, and then instead of asking their mother, they just came back and said, yeah, she said it was okay. So you can sort of think of this as, like, um, your dad text your mom just to double check. And then, um, basically, after that, you can, the application server can also ask for extra information, like, what kind of cookie are they allowed to get? Um, so yeah, and then the application server will like store their own sort of token so that they can keep track of you. Um, so yeah. So CAS has some advantages. Um, one of the big ones 
which is also, I guess, you know, there's always trade-offs with things. So, and people have different requirements. So, like, one thing you can do with CAS is you can restrict what kinds of applications can even use this login to begin with. So, like, you know, uh, someone can't just make their own, like, stupid app, like, that's steal your password dot Rutgers misspelled dot com and start stealing people's passwords or stealing people's information because the the the, the authentication provider uh, back at this step before it goes to redirect you it can check to say like should I really be sending this person to this application like do we really trust it um, whoops and then the other thing we can sort of do is we can, even if we wanted to, control what kind of attributes the application can get. So like, uh, you know, the, the uh, student accounting and billing can get your social security number, but my.ruckers.edu should never get your social security number. Or sorry. WebReg should never get your social security number because my.records.edu might display your social security number. <laughs> um, yeah, and then the, the chief advantage of having this separate authentication server with a separate login page is that the passwords never get passed to the application. So they can take advantage of your central auth system without uh, owning your users, basically. So, since we still have some time, um, I also have some random bonus content. So, there's some interesting stuff going on in the background. Um, auth is often riddled with lots and lots of edge cases, and it can kind of be stressful to try to weed everything out. Um, but some implementations have some features that allow you to take advantage of existing things, like um, or be composable. So they can sort of piggyback off of some other auth protocol, or sort of unify or be a bridge between two auth protocols. Um, a practical example of this is uh, what Rutgers does for third-party applications like um, Canvas, for example. Canvas is, I'm pretty sure, is actually hosted on Canvas's own servers and isn't in like the Hill Center basement or the ASB. And all of the code belongs to Canvas and we don't see any of it. So in order to add uh, extra security, we can use uh, SAML. Um, the other advantage to composability is potentially whatever service you're trying to use uh, doesn't speak whatever protocol you have. So with a composable sort of thing, you can sort of have it act as a bridge between what you already have and what the application wants. Because um, I haven't seen a lot of applications that actually will use CAS. I've seen there, there are plugins that you can get for some, but um, I think SAML is actually more popular. Um, so the implementation that we actually use is a program called Shibboleth. Um, it's sort of just another server like, you know, uh, Nginx or Apache um, that you just run on a machine and it does auth stuff. And what I speculate how it actually works is Canvas wants the SAML login, but we have CAS going on in the background. So what will happen is it'll do, it'll start to do the SAML auth loop, but then in the middle, it'll send you back to the CAS login page, and then it can sort of do a login inside of a login loop. So yeah. Uh, 
one of the reasons why SAML is more secure is because the, the let's see, where did it go? These sort of login requests um, will get signed using public key cryptography, which if you don't know what that is, it's basically you got one key that will lock up the requests and will say, this is definitely from this application server. And another key that the authentication provider will have will basically unlock that and check to make sure that it's coming from the authentication or the application server. Um, so why this is useful is so that you don't have like basically rogue applications showing up out of nowhere and doing authentication requests. Um, and you can prove that basically this authentication request definitely came from this application server. Um, and it also works on the, the backwards path too, where the authentication provider will sign the thing and then it'll get sent to the application server. And then basically this application server knows that this person was definitely logged in by the authentication server and someone didn't just make up a random login request that was valid and uh, throw it at me. Uh, so what else we got here? Um, the other idea of having things be composable is to sort of quickly be able to plug things in without having to write a lot of code. So you'll often see um, these sort of servers will have adapters to read stuff from like random databases, like whatever your favorite database is, or like some SQL database or MySQL. Um, or it can even be backed by LDAP. Because a lot of um, companies often have some sort of LDAP server sitting around doing stuff, because that's sort of just how things were done uh, before people started going crazy and making tons and tons of login standards. Um, so it's pretty good to be able to just sort of jump in and take advantage of stuff that you've already got set up and repurpose it for a, um, a new login system. And you can even do more complicated things, uh, like customizing the uh, login page. So one of the things that Rutgers actually provides is you can get uh, 2FA on your uh, on your NetID. If you look up NetID plus Rutgers, you can basically have it set up so that whenever you log into something, it'll send a thing to your phone. And basically, you have to accept it in order to log in. And this um, basically just proves that no one's, someone didn't just steal your password. Um, but why this is cool for having it in the SSO system is that like if I'm like a Rutgers application developer and I'm writing like the URL shortener, if I get the single sign-on thing to work, then I also magically also get this 2FA thing to work. And that's pretty cool because 2FA is hard to implement and you gotta do like security stuff, but it's already implemented for me and I didn't have to write any code to get it to work. Um, that was sort of cool just seeing it because I didn't expect it to pop up when I first tried to log into the thing and then it did and I was like, oh wow. I don't know, I think that's cool. You can call me a nerd if you want. What else do we have here? So, phishing, you know, phishing and spam is like just an eternal problem. Like, you can't escape it. W one of the interesting things is the OSS is part of a department called 
enterprise messaging, or it used to be called it. So one of the things that enterprise messaging, the wider department does, is investigating spam. So on my work email, the spam filter is set, or the spam like threshold is set super low. So I get all sorts of interesting spam. Like you would, he, he, he knows. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so this is an example of an actual email I got. And it's got all the hallmarks of just like a completely untrustworthy email. So we've, well, they, they actually did a good thing here. Because this looks like it's coming from a person who works at Rutgers. But one of the things that people can do is you can, when you send the, the email, to someone's email server, you can put whatever you want in the address. So I've been receiving emails for months from my email. And it's, it's sent from OSS dot, at oss.records.edu to me and saying, like, oh, I hacked into your account. I have your passwords. Like, no, you just said that that was your email. Um, so yeah, Thunderbird is also blocking content because that image is really what's going to do me in here, clearly. Um, and we also got some sort of like convincing image here. Um, the other thing is they're trying to say like, oh yeah, this is virus free. Avast has like secured it, which Avast didn't secure this, but there's no virus on it. So I guess you're not lying. Um, and it's saying there's a notification that needs your attention, please click the button. Which it's sort of prompting you to do something. But CAS isn't going to send you notifications. You're going to get notifications from whatever person or from like an email list. So I thought this was interesting. Um, and the first thing when you get a spam email is you got to always click the links because it's impossible for you to get a virus. So having the Linux machine also helps. What's not getting viruses? So we got this beautiful page, which you've seen before, but you haven't. So here's the game. Who sees what's wrong with this page? The URL is different. Yeah. We got someone, some bozo's WordPress website <laughs> at rutge.html. So, you know. Basically, they actually did a really good job. This is probably one of the best phishing screens that I've seen, or phishing attempts that I've seen. Um, you know, they basically pretty much copied and pasted the HTML from source, and then probably edited it with their H, uh, with their. Oh wait, it's HTML. So it may not actually be PHP. So anyways, they probably just edited it to submit the form to like whatever web page, um, which obviously you shouldn't type your stuff into here. Uh, basically, the idea behind this is you type your username and password and click login. And then it sends you to some strange place and it looks OK. But they just saved your password to a database. So I was like, oh yeah, sure. And I typed in for my username Lameo and password nice try. Um, I thought, and I clicked login, and of course it it just accepted that because it's not actually checking my password. And I get sent to a, a page that's like the privacy policy has changed, and it's on an actual Rutgers website. Like, wow, great, that was so urgent. Um, I thought for a little bit about writing a script that just enters a bunch of garbage into here. <laughs> um, I wasn't sure if that violates like the federal like misuse of computers or whatever law. Uh, you're nodding your head, no? I don't think it does. I've done. I've, so I've, I've written scripts to fill in. Yeah. No, so, it you did. yeah, I don't know. So, I didn't do it because normally, if you have to ask that question, you probably shouldn't. <laughs> um, 
So I guess feel free to spam them. Okay. So yeah. If so one of the things to note is we don't we're not actually in charge of CAS. Um, I've just had to dealt with trying to like CAS enable a bunch of applications that we work on. So I thought, you know, that was a very interesting experience and a good learning experience for me. Um, so I thought I'd share that with you. Um, but if you're interested in learning cool stuff or playing around or paying your rent <laughs> like I do, hopefully, uh, this is basically how to apply. You can either go to our website, which is pretty straightforward, or you can send your email in PDF or plain text format to our email. If you send it in Word format, we will laugh at you and throw it out. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I guess uh, we'll open it up to a Q and A. Yeah. I mean, we were going to wait for Jack, but mm -hmm. we could still we get started. I yeah. Guess. So Do you want me to start with the mobile app and then when you Actually, here? I'll start about questions about the presentation. Okay. I didn't. So does anyone have any questions about like off stuff or anything that was in a presentation? Sure. Uh, so which server boots you out if you're timed out for too long? Is it the authentication that does that or the application server that does that? Ideally, both. <laughs> so the sort of the weird thing, so how how a lot of this login stuff, what it relies on is this idea of cookies, which basically is something that you store yourself and keep handing back to the server so that it knows who you are. Um, and the, the authentication server and the application server will have their own separate cookies themselves. And the cookies will expire at different times. But if either expires, you'll have to do the login flow. Um, in a lot of situations, if like the application server expires first, it'll go and try to push you to log in. And then the authentication server will actually see, oh, this person's already logged in, and then just send them straight back. But now the application knows that they're still cool. Um, this is even cooler when you, you click on one application and then go to click on another application, and then you're already logged in. Um, yeah. One of the funny things is a lot of the stuff I work on, it's like the results are like, yeah, obviously it should work like that. And then when you really think about trying to do it, it's like way harder. So I had, I had this one demo that was basically like writing my own SSO thing, except it's terrible and you shouldn't use it. Um, and it took me like forever thinking about it and finally building it. And at the end, when it was done, the demo was you click to go to the thing, you type in your username and password, and you click log in, and then you just get a page that says hello world. And then I sit there excitingly like, look, it works. <laughs> like, oh yeah, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> Uh, any other questions about all stuff? Um, who is allowed to use CAS? Is it only Rutgers services, or hypothetically, could like an independent developer at Rutgers get access to CAS? So, um, unfortunately, due to like Rutgers policy, um, like independent application developers can't use the Rutgers login. Um, if, if you want to do this, there is a workaround that I recommend, which is basically just making sure they have a .ruckers.edu email, which is kind of a hack, but technically works. Yeah. Another hack is that you can use like Google OAuth, mm -hmm. but then restrict the subdomain. So like with Google OAuth, you're allowed to restrict the subdomain that people mm -hmm. are allowed to use. So if you use scarletmail.ruckers.edu, when you log in with Google, Google will redirect you to CAS. But that's annoying because then you have to deal with Google and its technology. So wait, that might that fix the app thing. No, it only works for students. It doesn't work for... Oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's, that's another weird thing that you'll see a lot with working at Rutgers. Oftentimes, we'll get deals from corporations to use specific stuff. But 
different corporations will give us deals, and we still want to get get both of them. So for students, students use the G Suite, but for faculty, they use um, yeah Microsoft Office 365. Mm -hmm. So if you're big enough, you can get sweet deals, sweet exclusive deals with everyone. Um, so yeah, OAuth is also another whole beast that has interesting stuff behind it. Um, one of the cool things that OAuth will do is it has this concept of scopes, which is basically um, giving applications permissions or asking for permissions to use certain stuff ahead of time. And then the application is restricted to just doing that. Um, another f funny thing with OAuth is because obviously there's Scarlet Mail going on. So one of the funny things that, uh, what? I turned it off. One of the funny things that s spammers were doing is uh, trying to hijack um, basically Scarlet Mail stuff. So if you, uh, showing you an example would take too long. But basically, it, you've probably seen before like clicking on some service and it goes to take you with like sign in through Google. And you get a page that says, oh, like draw.io wants to like use these permissions to use drive or whatever. And it says draw.io in the title. And guess where that comes from? The application itself specifies that. And you can just put whatever you want in there. So some people got really creative and put Google in there. So some unsuspecting users were clicking on links, and it was saying, oh, Google wants to have access to your drive thing. It's like, shouldn't you already have access to this? And then you click OK, and then you just gave a spammer access to send email from your, your Scarlet Mail account. And you know, there's the cat and mouse game where people are trying all different kinds of misspellings of Google. Yeah. Any other questions about auth stuff? OK. So I guess we can move on to the more general Q&A. Uh, yeah, you can ask us about working at OSS or Rutgers as a whole or any of the applications we work on. And um, also system administration and DevOps stuff, because we also do serves. Oh, here's Miles. Um, so I guess I should introduce, yeah, come up here. <laughs> Don't kick the camera. Well, you can put your stuff down if you want. No, you have to wear your stuff the whole time. Wow. <laughs> A high price to pay for coming late. Um, Here, sit. Well, I, I didn't introduce myself, so. Yeah. Uh, I'm Colin Walsh. I know a couple of you, maybe. Um, Sean knows me, obviously. Uh, I'm the technical lead for the Rutgers mobile app. Uh, we're remaking it, so don't you worry. I know that's not great. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so we're, we're definitely looking for, for people who are interested in other um, in cross-platform frameworks. Uh, right now, uh, the entire app is, is uh, native for Android and native for iOS, but we're looking at Flutter and React Native. So, uh, so we're looking for anyone interested in either technology. Uh, if you know one, you kind of know the other, um, but uh, it's just syntax, really. Uh, and uh, but the the structure is still the same. So uh, so that's what I do. Uh, and then Miles. Uh, yeah. So cool. So hi, I'm Miles. Uh, sophomore, planning major in computer science. Been working at OSS since like January, so less than a year. Wow. Um, but yeah. So. Uh, I've been working on uh, the Android app uh, earlier on, maintaining it, trying to fix a bunch of little bugs. Um, we're planning on pushing out a release finally at some yeah. point, uh, eventually. Yeah, once the agreement gets. Yeah, but, but most of the focus is on the rewrite. So through OSS, uh, I mean, I've been exposed to both React Native and Flutter and JavaScript and Dart. Um, so wrote some things with those over the summer. 
you know, to get a feel for both of them. Uh, and recently we've been, yeah, we've been testing out both those technologies, uh, try to figure out which one we want to work with. Uh, they both have their pros and cons. Uh, but yeah, so we just finished writing uh, like a proof of concept app uh, using some stuff from the like MyRutgers API uh, in Flutter, and that's pretty cool. And we're going to be doing that in React Native coming up. So yeah, so that's a bit about me and about the stuff I've been involved with in OSS. So um, just another thing to keep in mind is you know, we might throw out a lot of names of technologies. Um, I just like to say, don't don't let that intimidate you too much. If if you don't know anything, we we've had a history of hiring freshmen like the first semester, and one of the reasons uh, why Jack does this, our uh, our boss, is to really give um, students sort of a space to grow and learn stuff and push themselves um, in a uh, uh, professional environment. <laughs> and then if I could give a tip for uh, a lot of you guys interviewing potentially for OSS, we, we have a lot of reports that the OSS interview process is very challenging and very nerve-wracking. Uh, I want to apologize for that because that's not the intention at all. So if you go through the interview process, know that we're not trying to pressure you. We're not trying to make you feel like you're dumb or anything like that. We understand that it's a stressful process. The only thing we're trying to measure is your problem solving ability. So e even if we give you a problem that you don't think that you can handle, we really like to see you go up to the whiteboard and say, okay. Uh, I know that this is doing this, so maybe I'll use you know a, a BST or something, or you know as as my data structure, and I'll iterate through it recursively or something. You know, like just just something to demonstrate that you kind of like are 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 thinking in a way to solve the problem, even if you don't get it. Um, it's it's very important that we see that, uh, and we've hired people who don't even solve the interview problem. Um, just because that they, they demonstrate a clear ability to understand uh, what the problem is trying or, or, or the, what, the, what the problem is and a way to approach it. And uh, that's, that, that's pretty much like the cornerstone of, of programming, I would say. Um, seeing a problem, analyzing it, and then making steps to try and solve that problem. Um, so anyway, just wanted to say that about the, the process because I know that we, we hear that a lot for, for the process in general. <clears throat> OK, cool. So anyone got any like general questions? This question is mostly for Miles. Um, so you apply when you're, you apply to OSS when you're a freshman, right? Uh, yeah. So like, how much CS knowledge did you have? Um, so I kind of applied to, I really applied to like two different positions. Uh, so like, um, the Android development position uh, because we only uh, found out uh, that we were going to be, we have been planning on doing a rewrite of the Rutgers app, but we only ended up finding out slash deciding that we were going to be using uh, either Flutter or React Native, some cross-platform thing, over this last summer. So, uh, so back then, we were still planning on doing uh, native rewrites of uh, the Android app, and I think the iOS app, too. Um, so I applied for like the Android dev position and also like the systems uh, program position, uh, and so in terms of at least like well in terms of both of them I actually had experience really in both areas. Um, I was lucky enough to have uh, like an Android app development course that I took my junior year of high school, um, and so that's how I got into Android development. Um, and then I had, so I had written like a few uh, little apps, uh, like I mean a couple of practical things. Uh, a couple of practical Android apps like that, and then in terms of uh, like system stuff, uh, at least in terms of like Linux, um, I've been using like Linux in some form since I was probably like 12 or 13 or something, um, and so just over time I've just accumulated a lot of knowledge in that area, um, and so I mean so that really helped me out with in terms of just my knowledge for potentially being hired for that job. So I think it was just a combination of like those two things, really. 
Uh, but yeah. Anyone else? Is it still the case that to, uh, for OSS you have to um, stay for a summer? Yeah. yeah. So the first semester is, is we require you to work full time over the summer. Uh, so so the, the first year that you're hired. After that, you can you know get internships, apply elsewhere, do whatever you would like to do. No. So, I mean, we've we've taken people who are in 111. We've taken people who are in their junior year after taking, you know, three or four electives. You know, um, I, I think it really comes down to um, to problem solving ability. I think is is the number one. Um, I think I think number two it would be uh, passion. You know, uh, in some form. Uh, everyone that we've hired, the, the common factor is that they were, they demonstrated some passion of going outside of the course load uh, and learning something new, right? So um, if you made an Android app or an iOS app or something, or you contributed to something on GitHub, made a website, anything, used a framework that you didn't learn in any of your classes, um, the, the people that we reject the most are the ones that just list projects from their course load. Um, we, we, we're students too, we know what people take in all these different courses. Uh, yes, they're challenging, but they're not game changing. So we really encourage you to work on your own side projects and, and really like show us that you, you want to pursue this as like professionally, you know, and that's, that's the biggest way to, to show that. Any other questions? Else. Okay, so I guess we'll be here hanging out if you want to talk to us privately. Um, Jack, our boss, was going to show up, but he had to run home to feed his kids. Um, I mean, he, sh he should be here soon. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, if you if you want, we can show you guys our proof of concept. Probably, it's sure, really it's yeah. Stuff. It's sure. It's, uh, There's an HDMI cable. Yeah. It's it's very, oh, actually you you can plug in quicker. I don't have an HDMI on my computer. Um, it's very rough, <laughs> so I'm just going to give you that right now. But uh, but it at least should give you some sort of insight in, ter in terms of like what to expect for the next iteration of the Rutgers app and uh, and what you what you could be working on if you apply for OSS. Do you want to take this or is Miles taking it? Oh, is that? It's the mic. Uh, I mean, I think it's, it's probably a little whole bit or something. That's probably the big. Is this the one that uh, is broken, Miles? 
No, it, it's, it's actually working. It's just showing those errors because I have uh, analysis options in there, but it's, oh, it, oh. it does build fine. I'm okay. just so used to errors meaning can't build, but oh, yeah. it was actually fine, and I literally just never checked. Hey, Jack. Oh, hey. Everyone, this is Jack. He's the boss at OSS, <laughs> the big boss man. How are you? Uh, I've been running OSS for about 15 years. <laughs> we we answered a bunch of questions before you got here. Mm -hmm. Okay, regarding OSS. Yeah. Okay. Um, everybody knows how to get to the website. Everybody knows how to apply. Everybody knows that we need two non-family references. <laughs> I don't want to hear from Uncle Jimmy Joe that you're wonderful about shooting turds off of a fence. <laughs> I'm just drop that resume like it's hot. Um, truth be told, I do want to hear about the, the classmate, the lab worker, the teacher, the track coach. The person that said, oh, you know what? Billy was great. Oh, Jane was awesome. She was a captain of the track coach. She brought everybody up to her level. She didn't talk down on anybody. She was good at this and that. That's what I want to hear. I want to hear about character, because that's something I can't train. Enthusiasm, that's something I can't train. Okay, people can come in and say, well, I want the world, but you don't want to work for it. Then I can't talk about that. Um, as far as the different tracks, the did these gentlemen mention the different types of workers that are employed at OSS? Sorry, kind of, yeah? Okay. Um, obviously, Colin handles the mobile app side of things, and he's with Miles, and, you know, Sean was also there. Um, you know, that, that dealt with multiple different, I don't want to say platforms, but that's not accurate, is it? Clients, Android sort versus of. iOS. Yeah. 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 Um, but there was also front end versus back just the idea of making sure that you know the data is there when you need it. There's a whole bunch of stuff there that sort of glues this whole thing together that nobody sees. They just want to make something that looks cool. Well, there's a lot more behind that. But um, something to what Mickey has been working on. Have you guys ever heard of system reliability? Like being a SRE, a system reliability engineer. Okay. And you know what he pretty much does. I mean, there's also stuff called DevOps where you pretty much stand up the service make sure it works for a small group of people, and then you make sure it works for a place like a university that has like 70,000 people. That does not happen overnight, just because somebody says, oh, I'm gonna drink some, like what do you call it, energy drinks, and I'm gonna blow through this in one shot, no. Why, because that stuff breaks. You're gonna have to work with people, you have to plan this thing out, you're gonna have to learn code, you're gonna have to care about this thing. And that's where impact can be made, that's where a difference can be made. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, questions, comments, concerns? I think the last thing is we just want to show the proof of concept that we worked on for the oh, mobile yeah. app. So and then we have like two minutes left. <laughs> yeah. So, sorry, we got no, it's okay. So we got some neat stuff in the works. So here uh, I'm using, even though this is actually just static data, it's fetching this from an API. Um, this is my actual course schedule. Please don't stalk me. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we want to be able to show useful data in the app, um, and we want to also actually be able to make it personalized. Because, like, right now, the current iteration of the apps, um, it's, it's not personalized. You know, we want something where people can actually log in and see that that's relevant to them. So, we are going to have something like your course schedule. We have, um, you know, could say something about your degree. Uh, not my actual GPA, um, you know, links to useful things. Though this bit right here, this was just um, modeled after a very specific little thing that's on my Rutgers. If you go on my Rutgers, you'll see there's one little card that looks like identical to this. You know, you might be able to see your grades. Um, we're going, we're planning on having a like global Rutgers search in there. So, uh, so we also have uh, like my apps. Uh, this is all just proof of concept, so that's why things look uh, very different from each other in terms of style and content. Um, but we want to, you know, be able to search through uh, the like my apps links that are on my Rutgers. But we also want to be able to search through like any Rutgers domain or any Rutgers subdomain, so that you can find things that are actual that uh, you want to find. And finally, 
we have, did I put that key in? Yes, I did. Um, we want to have a nice uh, bus tracking app. What happened? Oh no, it froze. Oh. No, Matt. Did you break it? <laughs> no, I, I might have broken it. I can see if I can unbreak it. Did it unbreak? How did that happen? I don't know. Do I have the key in here? If I don't have the key in here, that's why. I do have the key in here. Don't steal our key. Don't steal our key. And, eh. There it is. Hey, there yeah. we go. Cool. So, you know, we want to have a nice uh, bus tracking app. Um, even better than Translock, ideally. Um, or should I say Translock Rider? Because Translock is just the company we get the data from. Um, so, you know, something even better than what they have. We want to have a, a live map that's actually going to show all these routes, show where the buses are. Um, but in addition to that, something we're considering is having our bus and maps, uh, our bus and map like sections of that be integrated. Uh, and then we want people to be able to ask for directions, like say, okay, I'm at, uh, you know, Scott Hall, or I'm at wherever I am. And, you know, I want to know what's the fastest way right now for me to get to, like, the Bush Student Center. Uh, and we want people to actually be able to do more complex things like that. So similarly, like, uh, just like this, uh, these little guys would probably be little links. And that would probably jump you over to the bus app and that would actually zoom in on whatever that location was. All sorts of things like that. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Anything else we want to mention? Um, I mean, we, like, like Miles said, we have a lot of stuff planned. Um, the bus app is the biggest seller, obviously, for the app seller, quote unquote. So, uh, so we're going to have a lot more features, um, and uh, it's going to be a lot m easier to navigate for Rutgers students and Translook Rider or something like that. Um, and then for everything else, uh, we are looking into a lot of different ways to authenticate users, which is that cast thing is very relevant because we're trying to figure out how to do that for the mobile app. So, uh, if that um, uh, presentation was, in, uh, was of interest to you. Then you might uh, that 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 could be something that you work on, which is in integrating the mobile app with uh, CAS authentication to try to get that done. So, um, but yeah, we have a, we have a ton of different features planned. Uh, there was talks around uh, natural language language processing, or or even I mean I hate to say the word machine learning or the you know term machine learning, um, but we might use something like that for the global search just to see like what people are searching and maybe predict what people are gonna um, look for at, uh, at a given time and all this other stuff. Um, so yeah, so it's it's a it's a really fun, rewarding experience to work for OSS. Um, you'll learn a lot, I guarantee it. Um, it's it's uh, it's challenging, but it's I think it's fair and. Um, yeah, if you have any more questions, then let any one of us know. We'll be here. So, yeah, we're good. Thank you very much.